Pod Tackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast presents episode 518. Hey, can you help? Recorded live on November 19th, 2015. Welcome to Pod Tackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I'm your host, The Storm, and we're back with more Halo news, more campaign discussion, more multiplayer discussion. And I have with me my wonderful co host, Asas and Godzilla T. No Biowolf tonight, even though it is his birthday. So happy birthday, Bio. Sorry you were unable to make it. He's busy celebrating. Yes. I don't know how he would celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> with, with his real life friend, yeah, with real just life the friend. one, just the one, just yeah, just the one, real life friend. Hopefully, they went to IHOP. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember a few birthdays that ended in the IHOP. <laughs> How I late? Don't. Well, let's put it this way: IHOP was open, the only thing open. Like I said, how late, or I guess how early? It, it, I would say probably more like early than late. Okay. Okay. The just, bars just, were closed and IHOP was the only thing open. <laughs> just, yeah, okay. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Anyways, so yeah, uh, today's Biowolf's Bio birthday. So for those in the stream, you can go send them a happy birthday wish over on Twitter. And we already tweeted out on Patekler, so it's already been out there. Feel free to blame him as much as you want today because it'll equally balance out how much fun he's probably having for celebrating his birthday. So... It is appropriate to go ahead and blame him for anything that you want. I guess for the remaining two and a half hours of the day as of this Thursday of this recording. But anyways, we got a little bit to talk about tonight as far as news. We got the first big content update since release. We have the Battle of Shadow and Light update, which includes 48 new Rex and big team battle. So we talked about this a little bit last week, but... People have had the chance to actually play Big Team Battle now. People have started getting the new Rex and everything. For those that have played Big Team, this kind of course, this question goes out to the chat. And I guess for Haas and GT, um, have you guys found Big Team Battle so far? I have yet to play a single match of Big Team. I absolutely hate Recurve. <laughs> Seven out of my ten placement matches were on that map last night. Yeah. Like, I'm sick of it. The yeah. other, I, mean, the I love the headlong remake. Choice definitely is a downer because it does seem recurve comes up way too much. Um, I played on the headlong re- remake tonight and had an absolute blast playing strongholds. It is, it 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 works so well for strongholds. I you know I never played territories on it. Uh, in halo 2 or but it's amazing how well strongholds works on it and i have a whole new appreciation for the smg how so well the there is one particular capture point and i can't think what it's called but it is um in the main building uh shoot i'm trying to think what they call it right headlong yeah headlong Across the bridge, you got where sword spawns, you know, sword spawns on third floor. Well, the stronghold is on the bottom floor in that hallway. If you're facing the building that goes down the right side of it, the, where you can drop down and head to the ghost and the banshees or the ghost and the banshee on Halo 2. But anyway, that SMG in that hallway is a beast. Yeah. Because it, it just, for me, it works really well. It's the first time I've actually got the SMG to work well for me. I would, uh, I was basically holding that one strong, at one point by myself. Dang. So you're talking about the area behind the base above Banshee spawn, right? No, 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 no. Oh, wait, the sword spawn. So you're in, um, okay, okay, you're, okay. You're in the, the building that has a teleporter receiver. Right. Yeah, okay. All right. I know which building you're talking about now. I had to think of where does swords spawn in headlong? Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't remember what the call out is. But you have the three levels. You have yep. bottom floor, the mid floor, and then you got top floor where sword spawns. And then you've got the shortcut to go around back 
um, that goes over the Banshee spawn. Right. We always yeah. called that Sword Tower back in the day. Okay, Sword Tower. But anyway, it, uh, the SMG spawns right next to that capture point, and it's the amount of ammo they give you is well for it was working out perfect for me because just about the time i'd get to the point where i'd empty my last clip the new one would spawn (laughs) gotcha it it was just it was great because i'd go in there i see somebody on my radar and you know i'd either throw a grenade or hit him with the smg and they kept feeding me grenades which was nice uh but that smg just the spawn rate (laughs) Probably ought to change the spawn rate because it is kind of, it does seem a little overpowered, especially if I can hold down one, if I can hold down a capture point by myself. Right. So how are these maps in comparison to the original? I know there's four different maps. There's one that's inspired by Longbow from Halo 4, Headlong from Halo 2, uh, Standoff from Halo 3, and what's the other one? Valhalla. Uh, from Halo um, 3. Re- the Longbow remake just doesn't it doesn't play like, anything like Longbow. It doesn't play and it, I don't I don't see it period to be honest. It it feels like there there's no kind of like that horseshoe design. There's uh-huh. the two bases aren't there. The top center base is is there but it's now it's like an overpowering tower. It it just it it, it plays <laughs> completely different and i don't know if that's because of your abilities or what but i don't know i i mean i liked longbow for for being a halo 4 map just fine but this just didn't it didn't fit i I didn't see where they got the inspiration outside of the snow well i could i can kind of see the inspiration it's just they took in a compressed longbow by a lot um and you don't have yeah you, know, you don't have that horseshoe pattern. It's kind of a circle that you can crisscross in the middle. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of enclosed spaces. It's not a really open map, especially where power weapons spawn. Tank is pretty much useless on that map because there's no room to move. You you have one one strip that you can really move the tank back and forth. And you basically move straight back and forth. You can't really turn and you get behind cover and peek around or anything. So, you know, the tank, you know, you'll get, you can get a couple of kills with it, but it dies pretty quick. Warthog, you're running around a Warthog. It's, it's doable if you have a really good driver, because it is, there's a lot of elevation change in the map. So you're constantly dropping off cliffs and stuff and trying to maneuver around things. It's you know where in longbow, yeah, you had to you went over hills and stuff, but you had a pretty pretty wide track to run through on the warthogs. I can see the inspiration, but it, of the maps that have come out, I, it's my least favorite. Gotcha. Yeah, headlong on the other hand, or whatever they're calling it now, uh, it pretty much plays just like it did in Halo Two, in my opinion. Cool. That that'd be uh, guillotine, and that was yeah. made by the Psycho Duck. Yeah, he did a really good job, and the team did a really good job. You'd know, getting the finishing touches on it. It plays really well. It works really well with the abilities. You know, they move some things around just because of the abilities. Like uh, when you'd go up to sniper spawn uh, from crane building, you had the little crate you could jump up on. There's crates there, but you don't need them because you have clamber. But they they made that space where you could jump on the crates and jump up if you wanted, or you could clamber. Uh, some of the some of the cover has moved around. The walls up on the catwalks on the outside of the buildings they're placed a little differently. And I, if I remember correctly, I th- think they might be a little bit wider than they were in the original game. Okay. I didn't try to I didn't try to fly fly up to the sniper campground with the banshee because i haven't got the banshee yet but gotcha so what about some of the other maps so we i guess kind of consensus is that recurve sucks the standoff the standoff remake is good i kind of feel like it's too big and flat like it's a good map but it's not 
I guess what I was expecting, it doesn't feel like it completely is tuned properly for the abilities and sprint and everything like that. It's good, but not great. So, but as far as it like kind of feeling close to standoffs, does it still play similarly? Like, as are all the, I guess it's kind of for all of us, do, does, do they play? Like, does the flow of the game still kind of feel the same? I guess for Recurve, it, it doesn't, based on what you've said already. But for the standoff, Headlong, and Valhalla remakes, do they kind of play the same, or are they different? The Headlong plays pretty close to the way it used to. The other three, not really. Okay. The And, and the reason, the main reason being is the placement of the power weapons. It tends to move. You know, it tends to move the battles to different parts of the area. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I have fun playing the maps. Recurve, not so much, but the others, I have, I have a lot of fun playing them, and that, and I'm still learning them. I've only got about five six games in, so I you know I haven't really developed a lot of opinion on them except recurve because four of those five games or four of those six games has have been on recurve gt did you notice um the laser seems to take two shots on vehicles mm, i hit um, a mongoose dead on and it took two lasers and same with the ghost and i asked somebody else that had picked it up earlier in the game and they said they had the same exact thing happen so i'm kind of curious if you notice that or if you even had a chance to well the the vehicles that i've killed with the laser were already damaged so i can't really answer that oh, question okay i did get a two for one a warthog and a ghost but mm-hmm. they were both damaged so not like the oni variants are they no these are just oh. the standard ghost and uh this standard vehicle none of the warzone stuff's in there i don't mm-hmm. even think the warzone stuff's forgeable like the special Oni tank or I wouldn't like be that. surprised if that stuff actually made it out. It's possible. I, yeah, you know, we don't know. Yeah. I was kind of hoping that the, at least the specialty weapons were available. Yeah. But so you could place a Norfang on, on there. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that'd be legit. I'll have to see when Forge comes out next month to see what they include and everything. I hope they do. I hope they get some of the legendary stuff in there. Just, even for crazy customs, it'd be well. I mean, cool like have. during the beta, we had Prophet's Bane on yeah. Truth, so like I, I couldn't see why not. Right. I mean, I'm sure it'll show up. I just I don't know if the the other vehicles are going to show up. We'll find out next month. We can we can suppose all we want. True. So as far as kind of the design of them, and this is just my opinion based off of what I've seen from the screenshots and granted I haven't played it yet, but it, is it just me or does it, does it still feel like kind of very forgy, very blocky? They feel forgy. Um, when, when the first like two or three games I played, I felt very lost. Like, you, you know, when you, you play a like ship and fully developed map, you kind of like just get this like natural flow by the colors and the lighting I felt like I didn't get to fully experience that when I first started getting on the maps. And once I ran around them once or twice, I started getting the flow of it. But they felt a lot harder to adapt to dropping in for the first time. But the the for the forge palette environment looks great. I feel like the building pieces are a little underwhelming. Well, the one thing that I've that I've seen so far is that the cartographers that built these maps, they did these in a couple of weeks or in a week, right? Yeah. They were only up there for five days. So they really didn't have a lot of time to really focus on their. They just laid the groundwork. The three, four, three multiplayer team actually finished it off. But the car. Yeah. They, as from a gameplay point, and I'm sure they did some aesthetics too, but not to the point that most forgers will. Well, and to be honest as well, when I thought that they were going to be making some maps, I thought they'd be making new maps, not inspired off of existing maps. Because to me, yeah, it's it's cool to have big team in there now, but I made a tweet about this earlier, how I really hope that these Forge maps aren't counted in the 
additional 18 that we're supposed to get because to me this is a real cop out this is a, a more of like okay we're here that you want big team here's your quick fix like yeah. there needs yeah, to be that, some that would be a little disappointing I, there yeah, needs to be some dedicated maps that have been built from the ground up that are not forged but are i guess native would be the best term to use but are, are native to halo 5 that are properly built for big team like those maps need to exist that's what i was expecting you know i knew the forge maps were gonna they were coming but i was hoping to get at least one or two actual big team maps not forged big team maps mm -hmm. which don't get me wrong i don't have a problem with the forged maps they except for recurve except recurve <laughs> <laughs> not to keep harping on that recurve just not my style of play but it with some tweaking it probably could work the but the other maps headlong they did pretty much a T for T. All right. Yeah, they pretty much did a, a they just it was almost a port is as closely as it played to the original. Out of those original screenshots, Headlong looks like it's the most true to the original Forge map. And I think the main reason for that is because you have a lot of the structural stuff in Headlong, whereas the rest of the maps that were forged, there's a lot more natural terrain going on, which I think yeah, maybe which kind of you why they don't fit. And... Right. Yeah. And to me, Basin, which is the Valhalla remake, is the one that does not look anything like... Oh, man, that map plays totally different. It's really fun to play. It, um, But it definitely plays a lot different. That that center structure is key. Because you're, you're overlooking both bases and the incineration cannon. You Like, that is a huge place to hold down. And the two games I got to play on there... Um, people were not realizing that and me twisted and there was uh one of my old high school buddies with us we were just dropping people from, mm -hmm. from that tower uh, they would just they run straight at that incineration and just lay them out over and over and over again do both bases have a sniper still you know i never even got to touch a sniper so i don't know yeah there are two snipers on the map but are they at the bases yes I, well they're close to the bases. They're not in the bases. Because of the hall, they were in the bases. They're off on these like little ledges, if maybe I'm recalling correctly, now that I'm thinking about it a little bit harder. Which, it's definitely, like in Valhalla, it is definitely important to control your sniper. Yeah. Because I was playing a stronghold match on that, and the opposing team was doing a really good job of keeping their hands on both snipers. Mm -hmm. We finally actually got the upper hand and started picking them up ourselves. But until we did, we were in a, a severe disadvantage. Yeah. Those snipers do control that map more than I felt like they did in three and four. But that I think a lot of that has to do with the weapon sandbox. Having a BR on that map is definitely critical i missed the pistol though i felt very very weird playing with a br rather than a pistol mm -hmm. every chance i got i swapped out the br for the dmr yep that no man that dmr is beast yeah it's definitely qualifies as the mini sniper rifle now Jeez, ooh, it's got some reach which is good i mean dmr should have that reach i think yeah it does i mean it fits the role it should have fitted it should have fit the first time. Okay, good. You know, it should be that mid to long range weapon. I mean, you can still use it short range. It's just not as, it, it's harder to control at, in the short range. Uh-huh. At least for me. But, I mean, a BR, I mean, a BR can reach out to that range, but you've got to be really steady on the on the scope to get that, that range out of it. But a DMR... It will, it will definitely tear somebody up. I actually took out a sniper with it. I was hitting Dang. him hard. Well, I was hitting him and descoping him, and he couldn't get a shot off. Okay, very nice. Let's see. So we talked about basin recurve and guillotine. So what about um, the standoff remake, uh, deadlock? Yeah, that, that's the one I was saying. Felt kind of flat and a little 
little too spread. Like, I didn't feel like the curve in Halo 3's version kind of felt more natural and kind of gave you that sense of cover. I felt like this, they leveled it out a little bit too much because you could see base to base almost no problem. Didn't have the rocks to obstruct you. Yeah. It, well, yeah, the rocks and the just like the natural kind of hills run that mm. the the bump when you're going to laser and um that location and i don't know it, it i mean it was fun i we crushed that team but i just i felt kind of weird um one of the bases they kind of like seemed to shore up the top you know you had that big dish on top of each base uh-huh. um that one seemed like it was uh they added a giant wall there to kind of box it out but then the other side kind of still felt like that deep big open base at the back but it you didn't have really the angle to look at it yeah i uh, I, I don't know that's how that i felt yet, so i'm looking forward to getting that one huh. <laughs> once you don't get recurve yeah right okay and it seems like a lot of people in the chat are saying kind of the same thing with recurve not really being everyone's favorite and a lot of people liking headlong so maybe recurve will be something that they pull from the playlist not too far out it needs some work. I don't mean to like disrespect the cartographer that made it because <clears throat> I can't imagine making a map like that, but it just doesn't seem to play the way I expect it to. And maybe that's why I don't have the best taste in my mouth for it is <laughs> it doesn't play how I anticipated. Well, hopefully we'll be able to get some maps that are actually natively built for Halo 5 and not just remakes and Forge. Yeah. I hope that's something that is coming down the line pretty soon because i know there's been a lot of talk recently about the longevity of halo 5 well they even mentioned that in the latest episode of the sprint you know they, they don't want this game to be the same game a year after release and okay that's cool but how, how are you gonna do that Let, let's get a little bit of a sneak peek into that vision shall we mm-hmm. i mean granted the game hasn't even been out a month yet but you're already seeing you know where how how that's what people want to know how are we going to do this well i think a big a a big key to halo 5's longevity is forge yes but but it can't be the only thing no i'm not saying it's the only thing i'm just saying it's a big key because that's what's in the past that's what's really drove the halo community is the forge now it's not as popular as it used to be you know, people have grown out of Halo. They've gotten to the point where they don't want to mess with Forge anymore, stuff like that. But having that community creation in, well, in the community is key to keeping people wanting to play Halo. The custom games is what keeps Halo alive. On the other hand, 343 does need to deliver us content to help keep the game fresh, new maps for B- btb warzone and arena because even with the forge influence people still want the quote on disc map or you know purpose built map for the particular game type that they're playing yep i totally agree with that i have that feeling i mean the wreck system yeah that will do something to keep people coming back because they get addicted to getting wrecked rec packs but that can only take you so far if you don't deliver on playable content then people aren't gonna want the cosmetic content Mm -hmm. well some people there are some games out there that that strive off yeah halo's not that type of game though (laughs) but it's i mean maybe not exactly right now but it's kind of becoming that kind of game i mean look at TF2, look at our sister podcast, Critscast. They have a podcast and their game is primarily funded through purchase of hats. Just virtual aesthetic stuff. TF2 went free to play back in, I think, 2007, 2009, something like that. And all of their income, or uh, not all of their, but most of their income comes in through aesthetic pieces. But what type of game is it? It's a shooter. It's a first-person shooter. 
It's a PC first person shooter. Yep. And it's hella fun to play. Now they're also coming out with updates to to the game. It's a lot slower than like console stuff, but console is very different than like you usually have a game, you have a few DLC packs, and then the this he's working on the next game, whereas for Team Fortress 2, is they've just been working on the same game for like the past 10 years. Mm-hmm. And they've just been expanding it. But, I mean, to the point I was making, though, there is a part of the community that will... Like, if they if 343 keeps on making aesthetics and making it to where it... I mean, every month they come out with something new, just in the rec system, people will... There will be people that will keep playing just to get those recs. Yep. And that would I'm probably be one of them. I'm drooling over the HCS Rex already. <laughs> I'm going to get that. Like, whenever they announce on how to actually get those, I'm going to buy them straight out. I will buy every color armor variant, which there are three, which they just tweeted out now about an hour ago. There's a red, white, and blue variant, and I will buy whatever packs that's needed to get the weapon skins and the emblem and all that stuff. I will straight out buy it. I will do it. Yep. Well, now, in TF2... Do they have a, is it a random purchase or you buy specific items? You're buying specific items, but they also have something that uh, you get random drops in game that are called crates, depending on how long you play and whatnot. And those are random. Ingrams. Oh, fair enough. I haven't played Destiny that much. So just the way they have the system implemented in Halo 5. I don't think they can rely on the rec system to keep Halo alive. No, not for the majority of players, not for the audience that Halo has traditionally pulled. And I think for the most part, it's going to be something where, yeah, Forge will come out, but you still need that base of native maps to the game that people can kind of default to. Because while Customs is fun, there's still a sense of playing the maps and the game modes that were designed for those maps. There's something just kind of pure about playing that experience. I mean, one of the things was whenever we had our anniversary party at RTX, we were playing Halo 2. We had the maps. We had built-in game types and variants off of those. And those were a ton of fun to play. Like, there are native maps and game types that they just fit well, and they work well just playing together with people. And while the Forge, Forge and Customs community is great, you have to have a strong foundation in the native maps and the native game modes that helps not necessarily feed or foster the Forging community, but is a, a base for the Forge community to, to get players out of and be, hey, here's a fun little variant. And it's like, okay, you go do four stuff and then you come back to Halo and it's kind of like you flux back and forth. You don't just play specifically Forge unless you're Duquesne who just does race maps all the time. But <laughs> it's, it's most, for most people it's a flux. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a it's balancing, a balancing act. It's a balancing act between, between all of it. They, they, 343 needs to build B, BTB maps. They can't just rely on the Forge community to support BTB or Arena. The, you know, I know they've got their hands full tying, you know, they're building rec packs and they're working on the DLC and stuff. I just hope that part of that DLC, the map DLC that they're working on is big team maps and not just Forge, forge creations, which the four maps that come out, they're absolutely beautiful. But they don't have the same feel as a actual rendered map or however you want to put it, you know, a map that is built by the game developer. Right. I, I wouldn't, well, this is me, but just based off of the screenshots that we've gotten so far, I don't know if I would say they're beautiful maps. I mean, they're very much forge maps for forge maps. They are very aesthetically pleasing maps not to mention they have flames they have flames they have flames they have red and blue flames okay that's a forge object forge object headlong cool. i mean headlong there are a few less shades in it than there is in the original map 
the the original map is has a wider color palette but it's 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 not ugly it's not like the nine billion forge world maps that we've played that all seem to have the same color in it yeah in a in color not yeah. colors yeah just, just the, the gray uh, yep it just like i said these are not these maps were built to follow a theme from an original map and i'm sure 343 said hey pick a map and give us your interpretation of it or duplicate it when they were there yeah i was just hoping they would come up with something that was more unique and not just a a copy that seems to, to me i mean i don't know if we don't know if 343 came to them and said hey make it off of established big team maps or if it was something that they agreed upon to do but it just seems like a waste of talent to take the community cartographers and say here remake this map or find a map to remake and remake it for us in halo 5 to me that just seems like a waste of their talent i mean part of it was them going to test out the forge tools and flesh that out i get that part but if they're going to make big team maps make some new maps if i want to go play all these other maps i'll go back to the master chief collection and play them on there i mean no offense to the forge maps here but i already have those maps and halo 5 Let's work on some some new content, shall we? The Valhalla remake. What was the name of that one? I'll learn. I'll learn them eventually. But that one Basin. play. I like. Yeah, Basin. I like the way that one plays. It reminds you of Valhalla in its rough structure, but it doesn't play identical to Valhalla. <sighs> it's hard to describe because I just I really have a hard time describing this stuff. But it feels different. Yeah. It doesn't, you know how on Valhalla you've got those, the the real strong positions like around Pelican and the top of Hill? Mm -hmm. Well, the Pelican thing really isn't there. And top of the Hill is about the worst place to be on the map. <laughs> it's uh, because it, it just doesn't offer cover like it does in Valhalla. You, you can't quickly drop back to regen your shields like you can in Valhalla because it's a very long slope. It's not real sharp like it is in Valhalla. Well, that's what I was saying, like where that center base is so key because mm -hmm. you kind of do have that cover within that building. Yeah, you do. And if you get a team that's organized that like actually talks to each other, you can overtake that center building relatively easily. Yeah. If okay. you have a disorganized team, it's overpowering. Hmm. Okay. So that's big team. At least that is a, is, exists in its current form. <clears throat> Hopefully we'll get an update down the line where we actually get some native maps in Halo 5. But for now, this is, I guess, tithing us over a little bit longer until we get Forge out next month. So a little bit of other news that happened as well. We also have some update on the Halo World Championship, which is the the largest event by far in terms of prize pool and actually worldwide participation. This is the first time I think we've seen any kind of truly worldwide ability or participation in this. And it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of other teams we get. I know we talked about this either last week or a couple of weeks ago, but we have six different regions that are going to be represented in the Halo World Championship Series. And the prize pool for that is actually up to $1.7 million now. Oh, a lot of cash. Yeah. So between last week and this week, we went from 1.5 to 1.7 million. I could definitely see by the time March comes around, this could be up to 2 million easy, maybe even 2.5. Oh, yeah. Just got to make sure that people are still playing Halo 5 and buying those wrecks. Yeah. And for the HCS wrecks, they announced new wrecks when we kind of mentioned it here a little bit ago, but there's. New HCS Athlon helmet, armor, air skin, uh, pistol skin, and emblem that's going to be available to be purchased. I think specifically those packs are going to be able to be purchased. And those are going to be, whenever you buy those packs, they're going to contribute directly to HCS. So I'm wondering how much, I mean, I, this is probably information that they would not be willing to share. But if they could share it, 
it'd be interesting to know how much money they've actually raised from Wreck and which portion of the money is actually going to the Halo World Championship Series. Because I can't imagine they're dumping all the money that they're receiving from Wreck into this. I'd have to imagine that they're going to be spreading this out for future HCS events and some other stuff that they're working on as well. It just wouldn't make sense from a business standpoint to do it that way. Sometimes it, something in my stomach tells me close to 50% of REC is going into HCS currently. And that could probably, maybe they'll change it over time. But I, I don't know. I, these numbers just seem to be growing that quickly. And I don't know how much people are buying. I really don't. I mean, I bought in a handful. Yeah. But I bought one. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be this popular, especially for Halo. But it turns out that people are just buying the heck out of Wreck. I mean, heck, I think Green's going to spend $1,000 already on Wreck. Oh, my gosh. He puts out a video like every single week on buying another 30 gold Wreck packs or something. Like that man is made of YouTube money or something. No, either that or either that he has a benefactor <laughs> that's uh, funding his habit. <laughs> Yeah. I guess that could be possible too. But it's one of those things that if it's working out that they're getting that much money from Rex, then awesome. Yeah, I just hope that I would hope that the bulk of the money they generate from Rex is going back into Halo 5 for content. I, I understand HCS, HCS is important, but I think supporting the game is just as important. As far yep. as developing, for one, more wreck to keep that revenue stream coming. But I want them, I would, I would uh, rather have them working on new content for the game as far as maps and wreck. Yeah. All the free DLC that we're supposed to be getting. Yeah. Let's get some of that stuff. Yeah. Because new wreck stuff is something that they, they could come out with like in a week. They could make a whole new weapon and vehicle skin probably within a week to pump out as a new rec item mm -hmm. what do you guys think about new weapons period not, not just so, weapons uh, well we're supposed to be getting the classic magnum we're supposed to be getting the the original spanker rocket launcher no i mean new weapons not remakes of old weapons i i kind of would rather them just tune and hone in the current weapon sandbox and keep throwing in these, you know, throwback weapons, I guess. Yeah, I would not say make new weapons after the game has launched. I think that would throw off the sandbox of the game. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they would test it plenty, but... Yeah, but even still, it's one of those things where the, the game is already made with a certain expectation of, of weapons in there. And ha having the throwback ones in there makes sense just because that is kind of the system that they set up from the from the get-go and having certain weapons that are traded a little bit differently like have different characteristics and traits about them but if you go and add a completely new weapon in there i think it's just not going to fit well within halo 5 yeah i mean i don't know what they would add but yeah i don't know if they would do that currently i don't think I'm they would sure they have plenty of work to do then to worry about a couple guns here and there <laughs> so as far as the other hcs stuff is concerned there's going to be 16 teams from six different regions 343 has partnered with three different esports leagues so for north america they've partnered with mlg for the uk they've partnered with gfinity and then there are four other regions australia australia new zealand asia europe middle east and africa and then Latin America. And those are all going to be done through ESL. So registration is currently open. If you head on over to halo.gg, if you have a team that you want to register, you can find the different regions to register there and get your team registered up. The top 16 teams, I believe, are going to be flown to the finals. There's no details yet on where that is specifically, but... There are going to be online events. There are going to be regional events for every region. So in-person events, online events. And there's kind of a loose schedule that they have. 
for the most part, it's going to be play starts on December 6th and registration is open now. So online ladder play begins uh, between December 19th and January 31st of 2016. It's going to be online qualifier qualifiers and regional in-person events between January 23rd and February 21st. It's going to be regional finals, except in the UK. And then from March 1st to March 20th, that is when the World Championship preliminaries and then the finals are going to take place. So that's kind of the schedule for all that stuff going on. And you can find out more information about all that at halo.gg. And that takes you over to the official HCS page or on Halo Waypoint. So that's all fun and good. We also had the final episode of the Sprint get released this week. They talk about a lot of different things regarding Halo 5. They have a few clips from launch from the from their seattle launch didn't see you in there anywhere haas they have some stuff regarding uh halo 5 product some new stuff that we haven't seen yet so i think there was a few teases on uh it's not the new halo encyclopedia but it's called something else like a, a new kind of bigger encyclopedia type thing that's going to cover everything from the formers so everything during the Greg Bear trilogy all the way up through Halo 5. So it's kind of like that next big evolution of what the encyclopedia has been. So that's going to be something coming down the pipe for next year. Uh, Laird, if he's still in here, he probably knows what that is. There's going to be... Uh, it seems like there's going to be... like we, You know how we have the Boomco pistol, plasma pistol, needler and all that stuff? And one of the product video bits that they had in here, it looked like they had armor that was actually going to go along with that yeah i noticed that stony props actually did some stuff with 343 partnered up with them whenever they had the in real life breakout and they had the boomco stuff there so i don't know if sony props is also kind of partnering with boomco to put that out there as a product or if that's going through some other partner that 343 has going with them but it looks like with the blasters we'll actually get some armor that we can get as well Oh, uh, Laird pulling through. It's called Halo Mythos. And so, Penn's Halo. Hold thank on, you for that, Laird. Actually, Penn's beat him. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah, he did. Oh, yeah, he did. There. <laughs> Discredited, Slack. Laird. Slack and Laird. Thank you, Penn's. Anywho, lots of good stuff in that video. Lots of uh, interesting interviews. There were some discussions behind the initial Rex. The initial? Wow. The initial Rex system. They talked about that a little bit. They talked about... Uh, between Brian Reed and Frankie, the story as it was currently set in Halo 5 and how they already have kind of the major tent poles and plot points for Halo 6 already planned out and they're just trying to figure out now how to flesh that out for Halo 6 and all that stuff. So it's a very dynamic episode compared to the other episodes in this season where these other episodes, the first four episodes were very specific to a particular theme. This one seemed a lot more all over the place. Mm. and unfortunately we were lied to and there's only five episodes not six and this one actually came out a day late so there's only going to be this episode as the final episode episode five of the sprint and that's pretty oh, much it shame. yes tisk 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 anywho we have a couple of giveaway announcements to make here we got confirmation from three of the four that we did last week and Believe it or not, the guy who won the Astros actually didn't claim his. So we have to repick a winner for the Halo 5 Astros, which I thought that would have been snatched up, whoever won that like pretty quick. But all the other ones that we gave away and finalized last week, they claim theirs, and we're going to be sending those out tomorrow. So congratulations to, go to those guys. So repicking a winner here for the Astro headset. Looks like we have... Oh, this is a familiar one. Clifford Mollering. Uh, he's at Vader of Engel. Uh, he, I've actually seen him like participating in a bunch of different contests that we've had up there, and he's pretty good on, on like responding and retweeting a lot of our tweets and everything. He's very active on Twitter when it comes to us. So congratulations, dude. It finally paid off. I'm pretty sure we'll, I will not have a problem getting a hold of him to to get those Astros to him. So congratulations, dude. I'll contact you uh, after the podcast, probably tomorrow, to make sure that you're up for, for claiming these. But we have four other contests that we 
did for the last week. And we have, I think, maybe one or two more that we're possibly doing. I have to go back and check. But we did four new ones. We did one for the Halo 5 Prima Strategy Guide. We did one for San Diego Comic-Con Lock and Chief signed posters. As far as I know, this is the only Lock poster that EK has signed. Uh, EK being the voice actor for Lock. Uh, we also have the Mega Bloks bundle, which is a signed SDCC Halo Mega Bloks poster, the signed SDCC uh, three figure set that's signed by Jay Fruchette and Andrew Sparks, and then also has the Gun Goose and the Covenant Ghost as well. And then we also have, thanks to Simon and Schuster, a copy of Hunters in the Dark and Last Light. So for the Prima Strategy Guide, the winner is, drum roll, Scott. <laughs> That's what his name is. Uh, uh, so I will be reaching out to him. That was an entry from watching one of our YouTube videos. So we have, uh, I'll be reaching out to him. So congratulations, Scott. <laughs> That's literally all he put down for his name. Uh, so we'll be reaching Scotty. out. To him. We'll be reaching out to him for for that one. So he won the Prima Strategy Guide. Uh, next one we have is the STCC 2015 signed posters, and drawing a winner for that one we have Wally. Also, just single one. Wally. 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 So he won our San Diego Comic Con. 2015 lock and chief signed posters so congratulations for winning that one and again we'll be reaching out to all these folks via email to have them claim their price claim their prizes uh next one we have is the mega blocks bundle and we are actually giving away two sets of these so we're going to be getting two winners out of this one first one is mel olsen uh he was a follower on twitter and then we also have Thomas Bentley, and he visited our Facebook page. So congratulations to you two. Both of you guys will be getting the signed San Diego Comic-Con 2015 Mega Bloks poster, the mini figs from San Diego Comic-Con exclusively signed by um, Andrew Sparks and Jay Frechette. You also have the Gun Goose and the Covenant Ghost, and then also, since I have a surplus of them, the 2014 Saint, um I don't think it's San Diego Comic Con specific, but the 2014 Mega Blocks poster, the Halo poster. So, congratulations to both of you two for winning that one. Then we have one final drawing to do, and that is for the Halo novels. So, the winner for this one is going to be Brianna Witchlass. I probably butchered that name. So, that was for following us on Instagram. So, congratulations to all of our winners. We will be. We'll be reaching out to you guys here this weekend for you to claim your prizes. And I believe we have just one or two more giveaways to do. Not many left. So we, we kind of exhausted a lot of stuff that, that we have. Did you announce the control? Yes. We did oh, that last, last week. week, I believe. That was last week. Okay. Yeah, I just blanked. Sorry. On with the show. Yes. Show must so, go on. Before we dive into campaign and multiplayer, there is one more thing that we have to address, and that is our poll of the week. This week, we asked what your favorite monitor was, Exuberant Witness or Guilty Spark. And I am very surprised on the results of this poll, to be perfectly honest. Out of 122 votes, it was an even split. A perfectly even split. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how that's possible. On that I one. I don't know either. That I put my feelings down. <laughs> that took me by surprise. That really took me by surprise. We got some interesting responses out of it on Twitter, some interesting replies. Um I thought Exuberant was awesome, but I did too. Come on, guilty spark. <laughs> yeah, he only tried to kill you twice. I know. Yeah. Like that's my boy. Someone replied to us saying that exuberant gave us a tank and guilty spark killed johnson so that was their justification i thought that was pretty pretty witty tank beats everything there you go 
So yeah, I was a little shocked to see that it was a dead even split. I bet you Laird made like 60 some odd accounts because he's all about the new and not the old and busted. <laughs> new hotness. <laughs> yeah, the busted. new hotness. <laughs> new hotness. I'm blaming I'm blaming Laird for the shocking results of this poll. He didn't have pen and tangent on there, so I didn't vote. <laughs> yeah, it w- he wasn't as much of a high profile character. Anywho. So that was the results of the poll. We'll be doing another one next week. Not sure what we're going to be asking quite yet, but I I was kind of shocked that that was the result. Yeah. Anywho, moving on to campaign. This week, we're looking at mission three, which is the last. We're back on fire team Osiris' side, and uh, the cut scene is actually between Lasky, Palmer, and Dr. Halsey. Dr. Halsey is explaining to Lasky how she tried to contact him weeks ago saying that there was an issue with Cortana. And we kind of now know that Dr. Halsey has been tracking what Cortana has been doing for the time that she's been imprisoned by Julem Dama. And there's this big discussion going back and forth between Halsey and Lasky about how Cortana cannot be trusted as an asset anymore. She has access to the domain, which is this big forerunner network that spans the galaxy. So, Basically confirms that, yeah, Cortana's back in Halo. We, we didn't, I mean, with the cutscenes in, in the second mission, you didn't quite know for sure if Cortana was back. But with the cutscene between Halsey and Lasky, it's like, yeah, okay, Cortana's definitely there. You knew what this was. Yeah. And Roland's over here in the background trying to get a word in and everyone's just ignoring him. Roland is getting really frustrated with these people. Right. And I have to admit, Palmer has a good line in this whole conversation. The chief just does what he wants. Uh Uh-huh. Well, it's true. And and the expressions on Roland's face are just priceless. Yeah, they did a really good job with Roland in this game. He doesn't have many lines, but they did a really good job with Roland in this game. Kind of wish he would have gotten a little bit more... Screen time? Flesh. Yeah, you know, these... I feel like there's been a big emphasis in the Halo universe on these AIs. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't it doesn't translate to the game outside of Cortana. I think, I haven't felt that. Yeah, I, I think agree. This game, I think next game we'll probably see more out of Roland because in this you know in this game he is still loyal to the humanity, and are I think you, in the next him game to change. Well, I think in the next game is when we might see kind of uh, not really a battle, but some indecision in it. Mm. Terminator Judgment Day. Yeah, sure. Uh, But no, it's just uh, the few lines that Roland does have in this are priceless. Like, shut up! Right. Cortana's alive? Yeah, he tries to get a word in edgewise, but... Halsey and Lasky keep on talking. Palmer's in there as well. And Roland finally gets Lasky's attention. And Lasky's like, you're out of line, Roland. And he says, yeah, but so is everyone else. The point here isn't whether or not Chief's going out to find Cortana or, or like what the issue with Cortana is with the domain. It's like it's it's he's taking it more of a personal route. It's like, why is it such a big issue? that Cortana's out there and is it because that she refused to die like she was supposed to after starting to go rampant? Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing that he says in there, yeah, the other thing he says in there is about chief going AWOL. You know, they're implying that Cortana convinced chief to go AWOL. And he's like, Roland's like, no, he basically implies chiefs on a mission to recover. Cortana or to stop her. And it seems like Chief picks up on what Cortana's doing a lot faster than yeah, a lot of else does. Do. Or faster than people want to give him credit for. Yeah. You know, like in the Mission Blue team at the very end. He I don't his like last it. line is or I don't like it. He knows something's up. And he knows he, Well, it's at that point it seems to imply more more or less that there is something up with the fact that he didn't know about Cortana and someone else did. Like, I think at that point it was more 
along the lines of we need to get to Cortana first kind of thing. And then I think through Mission 7, whatever that one was called, I think that's when she, the discussions between Cortana and Chief, he starts to realize, okay, this is really weird. Reunion. Was it called Reunion? Okay. Mm-hmm. I think it's at that point that he starts to figure out, okay, there, there's really not something right here. But we'll get to Mission 7 when we get to Mission 7. That's uh, a couple episodes away. Couple. Well, yeah, because 4 is a, a hub mission. 6 is a hub mission. So those are going to be wrapped into the next two episodes. So it'll literally be a couple. Podtacular's Christmas special presents... I don't think, not before <laughs> Christmas, because next week we'll cover Mission a 4 and 5. Halo. A night before Halo. <laughs> next week we'll cover Mission 4 and 5, because 4 is just a hub mission. And then the week after we'll cover 6 and 7, because... No, we'll cover 6 and then 7, because... Yeah, so 3. So one more than a couple, I guess, technically. Anywho. A couple. Well, a couple's two, so a few or several. However, it's it it we'll get to it when we get to it, all right? So it'll be there. Gosh, back off live stream. <laughs> After the cutscene, we get to the elevator part where we see this nice vista of a I guess a glass planet. If you can consider that a beautiful vista. Anyways, so Locke's team is taking the elevator down and there's some chatter between them. It's like, why are we taking the elevator down? And who is it? I think it was was it or Tanaka that basically said Tanaka. Okay. Well, I don't think they would really appreciate it if we just came in blazing in through the atmosphere down mm-hmm. to Earth. So we're taking the more diplomatic approach, taking the space elevator down. Yeah, I don't really want to go into a hostile territory if you're not trying to be hostile in a hostile way. Right. And this is the part where we're interested to or interested introduced to Governor Sloan, who does not take very keenly to the UNSC or Spartans. Pretty typical of outer colonies and outer colony government to not really take too kindly to UNSC. I think we got a lot of that evident in Hunt the Truth, but they're there. They get to the bottom of the elevator and they start helping the citizens of Meridian clear out the space, space elevator port, which is infiltrated with Prometheans. And uh, that's probably probably the toughest fight of this mission, especially on legendary is right when you get out the door. Cause it just, it takes so long to, to get all that out. And once yeah. you get after that part, you're in vehicles and vehicles get destroyed really fast on legendary in this mission. Mm-hmm. Like just melted. You really have to pace yourself, especially with the tank. I didn't really have much problem with the tank actually on legendary. No, it wasn't until the very, like the very last section where I started to have yeah, issues. I but... guess that's more, yeah, that's more where I'm talking, but but no, like the tank wasn't that hard. No, huh. we uh, yeah, me and my crew just seemed to keep getting that thing blown up at inopportune times. Sounds like a personal problem. Anyways, it is. No, it's a matter of using the vehicles. Whenever you're on legendary, especially, you need to protect the vehicle a lot more than you do on the lower difficulties. Yeah. Uh, avoid splattering things, especially soldiers. They do a lot of damage. <laughs> yep. So one of the things that I noticed, and I know this is really, really picky to comment on, but as you're going down the space elevator, whenever you get to like the transfer parts, you just skip like 10,000 feet. Like you can tell that you're kind of descending the planet. And then when you go through a little section and then come out, it's like two seconds. And you're like, you're falling through each second for each section for a good 20 to 30 seconds. But it's like you completely just jump a quarter of the elevator every time you're going through one of those like split zones where you can't see outside. And that kind of bugged me a little bit. So notice that. Oh, it stuck out like a sore thumb. It only took me like my second or third playthrough to notice that it was blatantly obviously that you're skipping so many different sections and it's supposed to be kind of like real time that you're going down well if they'd have done it in real time it would have taken an hour i don't have an hour for an elevator ride yeah i i know but still it's one of those things where it's like like fade to black or something like as you're going down like it it was just it was just disconnect enough to where it it just annoyed me 
And I know it's picky. It's really picky, but it just feels kind of weird to me. The whole elevator ride thing could have been done in a in a short little cutscene. Every time I see somebody play this level, the 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 fun thing is to ground pound. You're just killing time. Right. It just it's something that they could have done all of that in a short little cutscene and everybody would have been happy. You wouldn't need to yeah, make I that agree. a playable portion. You know, if they if they were if they had something to do on the elevator other than, you know, try to ground pound the AI, um, which don't get me wrong, it's fun. I enjoy doing it. But if there was a point to the ride, then I could understand it. But just it's you stand there. Yeah. For like a minute. I it just but that kind of bugged me a little bit. But anyways, so you get out um, just before you go outside, though, there is a piece of intel over to the right uh, just before you open the big door. So go over there and find it. You get out to the big, uh, the big first area. There's Prometheans everywhere, mostly crawlers and soldiers at this point. At the very end, you'll get a knight that spawns in. There's a few different power weapons that you can get. Uh, a few other pieces of intel in this area. There's two other pieces, one to the immediate left after you open the door, and then one under the security office where you activate the turret on the right. So definitely go activate the turrets. I would recommend that being the first thing you do if you're on any difficulty like easy normal or heroic um if you're on legendary i would say take out a lot of the crawlers first and then go activate the turrets as a distraction to help weaken the soldiers and then headshot the soldiers there's also snipers up on the pelican deck to the left that you can get there is a rocket launcher and one of the buildings over to the left area as well. And there is a few other weapons strewn around as well, but the sniper rifles and the rocket launcher are pretty much the power weapons on here. I think there's some stationary turrets that you can also get on as well. I wouldn't use those unless you were playing co-op. I still wouldn't use them. I wouldn't either, but I would say like if, you, if you're planning on using them, wait so you're playing co-op. There's also a saw on in that area as well, which works really well on the soldiers. Yeah, I don't remember where that one was, so I, that's why I didn't say. Uh, it's just to the left by the first piece of intel. Well, not too far from the first piece of intel. You actually have to go down, uh, and there's a cave where it, spawn- where it sets. Gotcha. There, there's a path over there. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about now. Gotcha. So that's kind of the big area at least on legendary i think that's one of the more difficult areas the second to last section the place where you get the tank i think is probably the the next hardest area but after you clear out the final the final few enemies which you can actually bypass by the way you can actually get over the gate and there's actually some dialogue that goes back and forth between fireteam osiris and governor sloan like when you activate the turrets, Governor Sloan says, hey, wait, you activate the turrets? And um, Locke is like, we're here to help, Governor. And it, there's a part where if you actually go over the wall before you clear out all the enemies, before you clear the lockdown, Governor Sloan will come over at the intercom and say, hey, I thought you were supposed to be helping us here. And Osiris just kind of ignores him. But anyways, whether or not you just go straight over the gate or you clear out all the Prometheans, once you get into the next area, you have two gun gooses and a warthog. Uh, if you're running solo, I would definitely recommend having everyone else get in the warthog and you get in the gun goose. There's also some power weapons that you can grab if you want as well. There is a Spartan laser, which I recommend grabbing for one of the events coming up uh, pretty soon. And there's a couple other power weapons there that you can grab. I forget what the other two are. I think one's a shotgun. I can't remember what the other one is. I think it might just be like an AR. On the other side, on the other side of the wall, all there is is a Spartan laser. Hmm. What do you mean on the other side of the wall? Once you open the gate, the only weapon uh, you've got the mongooses or the two mongooses, the warthog, and the Spartan laser. That's it. All the other weapons are in the first area you fight in. No, but like in the in that building with the Spartan laser, there's two other weapons, and I just can't remember what they are. Hmm. No, they're not listed on the guide, so... So, yeah, I don't think they're, like, super power weapons, though, but they are... There are two other weapons there 
that you can at least refill on ammo or whatnot. So getting your gun goose head on down. The Crash Pelican down at the bottom actually has another piece of intel if you're hunting for that. So you can you can grab that. There's a radio nearby that you can grab. I primarily, and you can do this on any difficulty, just drive through all the enemies. You can just bypass a lot of them until you get to the very end where you get to the bridge that's blocked off. You have to clear out the few soldiers that spawn in that specific area. There's... I think three or four soldiers specifically tied to that area, as well as a couple of crawlers. And once you clear them out, there's some dialogue that activates between Governor Sloan and Osiris that he's kind of thanking you for clearing out the bridge. And he opens up the bridge for you to, to go on and, and help um, everyone further along. Before he opens the bridge, though, there's a little bit of dialogue that gives you time to walk back behind kind of an observation area. You can find a Hydra back there, BR ammo, and there's another piece of intel back there as well. So you can grab all that stuff or give it to your AI buddies. Uh, so go pick all that up, get your piece of intel. And then after the door opens, there's going to be a hog that's in the middle of the bridge. And this is where I think the Spartan laser comes in very handy. There's two soldiers that spawn in and take Marines out of a Warthog, and there's a clever little line that Buck says, and he's like, wait, soldiers can drive? <laughs> I thought it was a good line. I thought it was pretty clever. And I use the laser to take that out. That It's pretty effective in getting that out pretty quick. And it's useful for the next area, too, where you have the Knight and a couple other Prometheans as well. So there's this big open area where there's like four or five different groups of Prometheans. If you go up to the right, there's a few rail guns and some standing turrets that you can use. There's a fresh new warthog in that area as well that you can pick up. Some more gun gooses if you've taken damage from the ones that you have. And some... There's another weapon that's up there too. I can't remember at the moment. I'm trying to look for the guide to see if I can find it. But uh, there's a weapon. Oh, I see. There's the two turrets and the railgun. Uh, but yeah, the guys only show the power weapons, but there are some other. No, they show them all. No. Well, I mean, they show BR and DMR. I've only seen the guide show power weapons. Anyways, so you get up to the the right area if you want to grab some of those those weapons. There is, uh, like I said, uh, fresh. Warthog, there's actually two fresh warthogs in this area. There's a few mongoose as well. There's also a little base up to the left where you can grab another uh, sniper rifle if you want. And there's another weapon crate over there as well. And you're basically just kind of clearing out this area. And Governor Sloan will, will come over the intercom. And after you've kind of been fighting for a while and clearing it out, he mentions that um, if you help clear out the area, we might actually have a little present for you. And it turns out that they have a tank. And there is a, a little trick there is if you want to go straight to where the tank is, climb up on the building, there's a vent you can ground pound through and get the tank early. Oh, you can actually climb up that building? Yep. Oh, nice. <laughs> there's an air vent on the top of the building, and you can ground pound through it and pick up the tank early. I knew about the air vent. I didn't know that you could actually climb your way up early. I'll have to try that. So if you do that, then you get the tank. I guess it opens the door early. There's also a Hydra in there. There's a piece of intel in the tank room as well. And I, I haven't been able to figure out what the trigger is. Like if you're going the regular route and actually grabbing the tank, I think it's once a certain amount of enemies have been eliminated in that area, then the door opens up. But however you get the tank, you grab the tank. There are three Premium turrets that spawn. You can take them out with two tank blasts if you're on Legendary or a tank blast and some other damage from a warthog or a gun goose if you have co-op buddies driving that uh as well and you make your way on up and there's a, a knight there's a few spawn warps in with some crawlers and soldiers until you get to the very final area now if you're playing on legendary this is where you actually find the skull before you get to the very last area so after you make the s curve you're you go under an archway and you have a your first warp zone of Prometheans, take them out. And then you have a second warp zone of Prometheans. Just after you take that out, you kind of want to look up and to your left. 
you'll see a transport ship flying in and there will be a phaeton following it that's destroying it. If you if you destroy the phaeton before it has a chance to destroy the carrier or the uh, the transport ship, you'll hear a little grunt birthday party sound and a skull will spawn. And there's three different areas that will spawn. Two of the three areas are, are marked off by non-exploding barrels. And there's ones that's actually close by to the area where you kill the phaeton. There's one up there. There's one just above the tank garage. And then there's one underneath an archway back in the main area where you first came in after the bridge. And we'll have that up in our skull guide when we get that out next week, which my voice has returned to normal. So I'll be pumping out those guides this weekend for you guys. So all those guides will be out hopefully by the end of this week. Also, if you have the Prima strategy guide, you can find out where the skull is on that as well. So the last bit of this level is, I think, probably the second hardest. At least you have some armaments with warthogs and tanks and gun gooses if you've brought them up this far. And you go through like 12 to 15 waves of Promethean uh, spawn warps. The last, the very last one has two knights that you have to fight. Most of them are a mix of crawlers and soldiers. Some of the soldiers have the splinter turrets. I would definitely recommend that if you're um, playing solo, stay in the tank as long as you can and then use the splinter turrets or go up to the platform on the right, grab some power weapons that you can use. There is a variety of power weapons up there and then there's also a little area on the left by the door that you can use as well. There's rocket launchers, there's sniper rifles, there's rail guns, hydras, saws, Spartan lasers, Goss turrets. There's a whole slew of power weapons. Like They, they definitely prepare you <laughs> for this fight. There's a, a lot of power weapons that you can use to your advantage here. So there should never be a moment, even on Legendary, where you're out of options. They, they really made this fight pretty easy. Yep. <clears throat> I almost felt that way with all fights in this game. I never felt like I was under-equipped. No, well, first time I played through, I did, but that's just because I didn't know where... I hadn't found the weapon caches. Did you play co-op or... No, I played solo. Hey, Biowolf's in the chat. That's probably where... Hey, Biowolf. Hey, Slacker. Go celebrate. <laughs> Hashtag playing Biowolf. And at this point, Governor Sloan is very thankful and very happy that you have successfully defended him. And I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but when you're driving up, the uh, the path in the tank. There's a part where uh, Governor Sloan is like, if you can help clear out the route between you and town, it'd be really helpful. And Buck has this awesome line. He's like, basically, I like how he went from, hey, get off my planet, to, hey, can you help? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't in do a very good country, job. Yeah. In his best country boy accent. I like how he went from, get off my planet, to, hey, can you help? Get off my property. Get off my lawn. And there's two fun achievements on this one. Yes, there are. You've got uh, the first one uh, you don't have to do in co-op. It's going the distance. You basically complete the level without using a vehicle. The second one is it has to be done in co-op. No, it doesn't. Yes, nope. it does. Nope. No, it yes. does not. Well, I got the I got it twice. I got it twice without playing co-op. The achievement states it has to be done. I in know co-op. it says it, but you do not have to do co-op. Okay. Well, I tried it and didn't get it. It's and the one I where you don't use, use smart it. scope, right? Smart link, right? Yeah, you do not yeah, have I, to do I co-op. Went the, I went through the whole level without using it, and I didn't get it. Okay. It it must be bugged. Anyway, it's called shoot from the hip, and it's complete glass. In co-op, and this is just what it says, without using Smart Link. So no zooming in. Right. And it's actually not that hard to do, believe it or not. Because once you get to the vehicles, you're, you're pretty much in vehicles. Yeah. You know, after you get through the first part, it's fine. But that first part, remembering not to touch the zoom button, especially, well, you know, especially when you're carrying like a BR or sniper rifle, it's... Mm, Heck, the first time I did it on accident, I wasn't even trying. And I <laughs> I just got the achievement. Anyways, but yeah. So I, I don't know if it's just me 
with it being bugged, but I did not actually have to have it be on co-op. And funny thing too, the the achievement where you have to get the hunters uh like on the, the mission Ballast and Nyon, you're supposed to have it to where you knock the hunters off on heroic difficulty or higher. I did that on easy and yeah. I got the achievement. <laughs> so yeah, there are some achievements in here that are they that don't match the description quite right. So fiddle around with some of those. Just try it. But that were pretty much runs off the mission. That's that's pretty much it. So there's six pieces of intel. Skull the skull you have to get on legendary difficulty. This is the legendary skull that you have to get. And yeah, two achievements. Pretty easy mission, actually, if you think about it. Not that difficult. Yeah, definitely. I think this the most story that we get is definitely in that first cutscene between Halsey, Lasky, Palmer, and Roland. That's kind of the big story bit that we get. Yeah. You see the whole kerfuffle bit back and forth between Fireteam Osiris and Governor Sloan, be it UNSC versus Outer Colonists, but that's kind of typical. It plays a little bit more into the story as we get into Mission 4, 5, and 6, or 4 and 5, I guess. But for all intents and purposes right now, it really doesn't carry much substance compared to that first cutscene. So yeah, that's the Mission Glassed. Pretty easy. But once you get past that first part and get to the vehicles, it's smooth sailing from there. So for multiplayer this week, uh, not going to touch on Big Team that much. We talked about it a little bit earlier, and I haven't played it yet. So I figured we'd go ahead and talk CTF on, was it Coliseum? Is that the map I'm thinking of? Yeah, yeah. That's a great map and a great game top. That, I think Coliseum is the staple ctf map for halo 5 yep i think that one in truth definitely take the cake for ctf see i haven't i don't think since i've played well granted i haven't really played the arena that much i've been playing a lot of warzone but i haven't played truth yet since it's actually come out hmm. believe it or not i get it a lot in the team arena playlist see i haven't gotten um, the team of but... four yet to to play with i haven't really been confident in going in like on my own to get a good rank like that's completely an understandable feeling like i'm waiting for a time that i can play with like you and jack or or whoever like have a a solid team to go in with and actually play for a good placing the only thing i'm ranked in right now is swat and i got placed straight into onyx which is ridiculous nice that's that's another topic we'll probably talk on here pretty soon just how in my opinion how and actually from a lot of people on twitter talking to twitter just how the ranking system just doesn't really fit well right now with how people get ranked so quickly off off the start but i'm hoping that's something that they fix down the road right yeah, honestly but that's for another for me, show it seems to be working so skill so. is working ranking i do not think it's working skill is working all i know is i'm <laughs> All I know is I'm getting matched against people that are challenging, but they're not overpowering. Yes, but someone like me, I should never, ever, ever rank above a platinum. Ever. I wouldn't be so sure. I'm pretty sure. You're definitely better. You're better than me, and I rank platinum four. To be honest, dude, I don't think you should be ranked platinum. Like, I think there's, I think there's a lot of people the out playlist. there. No, you get... You get ranked so high so easily. It's it's a joke. There, It really should... like I was thinking about this throughout work today. And it, it really should be... Platinum's the bronze. Well, no. It, it should be that depending on how many people are actually placed, like there, there should be... I wanted to say this for another podcast, but I, I guess I'll touch on that now. There should be a ceiling to where whenever you do your 10 games to place that you enter in at a certain top tier, whether it be you're at the tier three gold or tier three platinum. I would, I think it has, it would have to be one of those. You, I don't think there should be any, any reason that after 10 games, you should be placed into diamond at all, let alone Onyx or championship. There, there, it, it, it just should not happen. Hmm. Well, how many of your 10 games did you win? And SWAT? Yeah. Seven. I didn't win all my SWAT games and I landed in Onyx. Yeah, Onyx and FFA seem very easy to land in Onyx. 
Yeah. And I don't know if that's just because the player population just isn't that great. So everyone is getting weighted to the top. But really, it, it like Onyx should be a percentage of of top players. And then championship is that top 200. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, I, I think championship should be a percentage as well. But to me, like championship should be the top 1% and Onyx should be like the top 5%. Something like that. I mean, there are there statisticians that could probably figure out what that balance should be more like. But in my opinion, after 10 games, you should never be ranked above like a gold or a platinum. You should be playing games to because, because if you get put into a rank of Onyx, then you just sit at that rank. You don't go back down with how the rank system currently works. Oh, I think everything needs rank down. Well, and, and that's why I say that you should there should be a ceiling to where you enter your rank. Where like if, if you do play well, then likely if you start out gold, like if you look at it, there there's five tiers. There's bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond, with onyx and champion being the top of the diamond section. Because you can I believe you can technically drop out of onyx into diamond. At least that's kind of the way they word it. Maybe you can't. The way they worded it, it seemed like you could drop out of Onyx back into Diamond. That's what it sounded like. Um, if that's the case, then you have five tiers. If you if you play to an effect, and I, I still think that it weighs too heavily on team play, but regardless of that, Halo 5's more built around a team aspect anyways. If you play those 10 games and you play it very well, then you should be placed into, in my opinion, gold. And then you keep on winning games, then you rank up the ladder until you start to balance out with everyone else. You don't just start way up top because, hey, you won so many games and, hey, the population pool is so low that everyone's bouncing to the top. It, it shouldn't be like that. Like, I, I personally don't think my skill, when I've played against pros and semi-pros, when, I, when I'm scoring, like in FFA against pros, like I'm getting one or two kills for their 20, that there should be any way that I'm grabbing Onyx out of a 10 game placement. That just does not seem right to me. And I think if you start off with having some kind of ceiling for your rank after that first 10 ranking, and then you rank up and earn that rank, then I think that's more legitimate. And I think that kind of balances out the ranking aspect better. I don't know how t tightly coupled skill is to rank because I've heard everyone say that the skill matching in Halo 5 is fantastic. The skill, the skill <laughs> matching is on point. So they nailed that. But as far as the ranking is concerned, it does not make any sense in Halo 5. It just doesn't. All I know is that I'm having fun playing ranked playlists. Where in the previous games, not so much. That's good. I think that's been one of the things that they've been trying to push with having all ranked playlists because <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was it was the fact that the skill level that I was getting matched against wasn't my skill level. And in Halo five, I'm getting matched to people with a with my skill, which I'm enjoying. Yeah. It makes ranked play a lot less frustrating. And a lot more fun. But back to CTF, I've played two matches on that map and absolutely had a blast. It's there is just so many ways you can move the flag on that map. It's really it's I think it's like rig works well for Slayer and Strongholds. And I think Coliseum just nails it for CTF. I think they did such such a great job for Coliseum. It kind of works for Slayer. Not quite as well. It, it still works. Haven't played Strongholds on it. I don't think it would necessarily be a big, a good Strongholds map, but CTF just works perfectly on this map. Yeah, I've played Slayer on it, and it works really well for Slayer as well. Uh, its strong suit is Capture the Flag. Yes, right, yeah. But it does for Slayer. The Just the map movement, or being able to move the flag across the map leaving the bases you can leave in three directions 
three immediate directions, and then you can split off into a dozen different directions from there. So it, you know, it initially kind of funnels you into three directions, but once you get, once you fight your way out of that, the options just go crazy. And people that learn the abilities and get good with the abilities are going to be able to move the flag really fast. Right. And one of the things too with CTF that they, I don't think they had in there in the beta necessarily, but one of the things they definitely talked to, I think in a sprint or some video or some article that they did is you can actually use all of your Spartan abilities while you're carrying the flag. So ground pound, clamber, thruster pack, you can use all of those while you're carrying the flag and you will not drop the flag. Yeah, the only thing you can't do is sprint. But you can thruster. Yeah, I you guess. You can thruster, yeah. but you can't sprint. Yeah, that's right. Which still, you have a lot of mobility with that. And you have the the, the, yeah, still. the flagnum, which I believe is is a magnum. I don't think they're separate this time in terms of how many shots to kill. So it's very versatile. And you can drop the flag, which is nice to have that back. And for Coliseum, there's just a lot of different ways for you to move the flag. One of the nice things about this map, too, is I think the power weapon placement, having them be elevated up there, puts it or makes control for the power weapons and those towers good focal points for battle but it really makes it to where those areas are important to hold especially when the power weapons coming up yeah well definitely the rocket launcher the sniper sniper can be deadly there's a lot of times where it can't be deadly but yeah there's a team very set up to help you make it deadly yeah yeah it, you it's it needs a lot more support than it normally does than you know in a larger map you your team has really got to work to support that sniper to keep it from falling in the other hand, other team's hands but also to still make it an effective power weapon mm-hmm. where the rocket launcher it it almost shines on that map because there's so many corners that you turn and surprising somebody with a rocket launcher is pretty pretty quick or pretty easily done there yeah one of the hidden gems on this map and I think it's part of its location on the map is a scatter shot. If you are kind of patrolling for your team, that thing will decimate a team. Oh yeah. Because there's so many little corners and everything like that. It really is hard for for anybody to plan against that. Now I know it does have some inconsistencies, unfortunately, the scatter shot, but Man, you get something to land with that bad boy. You you can really start doing some work on there. Yeah, the scatter shot works well on the map too with all the corners. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to actually be able to use the thing, but yeah, it doesn't have the spread that it did in Halo 4, it seems. Well, there's also the splinter grenades are really effective on this map. Yeah, especially when you're pushing that rocket. Yeah, I mm-hmm. always pick that thing up and drop it right on their ramp to at least hold them at bay. And, you know, they'll still toss grenades at me and sometimes I'll get one or two to drop. But, you know, it, yeah, definitely is very effective. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. With about two That's seconds. Right there. That's where it's it the rains nades there. It's yep. raining nades. Hallelujah. It's yeah. raining nades. Podtacular, the unofficial karaoke podcast. There's lots of nice little pathways, too, to run the flag. There's probably five different, I guess, kind of main routes that you could oh, take. Yeah. It's just yeah. it's crazy how many different routes there are and, and ways to cut people off, too. I feel like Coliseum mm-hmm. is going to be that map that launched with the game. You know, like in Halo 3, you had Guardian. Halo 2, you had Midship and Lockout. Um, I, I feel like it's one of those maps that is really just going to kind of like stick for a long time and people will look back fondly on it. it, it that That's the map that it feels to be. I think Coliseum, the rig. I don't know if the rig has that yet. I love the rig. Rig seems very mixed. I'm split on it. I don't like it for strongholds. A lot of people seem to like Fathom. Fathom is cool, but it gets very campy with the giant wall over top mid. Well, and there's a lot of central fighting around the 
the two ramps leading up to the the big bridge. Yeah, it's definitely two choke points. Yeah, Empire. I, I think I feel like Empire is the new haven in the sense that it's going to be used, but it's just been like drilled in since the beta. Yeah, I kind of get that sense with Empire, and I like I love Plaza personally. I don't know if that's going to be something where it is going to be competitive. But whenever I've played it, I've just had a fun time playing Plaza. But we are talking about Coliseum. Yeah, I enjoy Plaza, but I like Coliseum a lot more. (laughs) Yeah. It just, it's clean. Yeah, there's a lot of places to hide, but there's not a lot of distraction on the map. As far as, you know, plants sticking out and or just scenery that gets in the way. I'm just trying to think of how I want to put that. Plaza, yeah, it's a nice map to move around, but it's got so much stuff in it. Okay, yeah. Even with the stuff, though, it, it feels feels fun to move around in. Yeah, it's just the stuff is irritating. I think the stuff gives it some character. Put the stuff in different spots. <laughs> I guess back on Coliseum, what... uh, I've been kind of thinking if they add other game types, which hopefully... and. Probably they Oddball. will. What other game types do you guys think on there? I think King of the Hill would be great on there. Could uh, be. King well, of Hill. Would def- it would d- assault would be good. Like neutral, oh, like a neutral bomb? Neutral bomb assault? I don't know about assault. Not I one think bomb. Oddball would be good. I love bomb. I love bomb. But it needs to be neutral. It can't be that. It can't be one bomb and, you know, one team pushes and then you're on defense. I, it needs to be one way so well i was thinking more like multi bomb. i could see neutral bomb possibly working odd boss just screams out to me for some reason though oh yeah it's one of, it's kind of like that that like we just said you know like that midship where neutral it's that it, it really is a versatile map that really could work for almost anything pin says ricochet that's an interesting idea I don't. I don't see Coliseum as it. No ricochet something. I don't know either. Like it. It. It doesn't feel like ricochet is going to be something that's going. Like grip ball will come back obviously because the grip ball community. But ricochet, it was a cool concept, but I don't think it grabbed that many people. Sadly, I. I grip ball's cool, but I think ricochet plays more to my strengths than a grip ball does, and maybe a lot more shooting a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's why I'm a lot more pro ricochet but well i think ricochet is going to come back as a game type just for the purposes of griff ball because it works the ricochet game type works so well for griff ball as well i guess i haven't thought of that i'm not a big griff ball follower but Uh, yeah we're definitely the wrong people to be talking about griff ball on in ricochet versus assault well griff ball is going to be on on specific maps, and I, I have a feeling when the Griff Ball's come going to come out, they're going to use the Breakout setup. To be perfectly honest, I can see them using the Breakout Arena for Griff Ball, not Forge maps. Well, yeah, because it fits that arena style. I'm talking about the game type, not the actual map. The e- Coliseum is a very versatile map. It works. It's will work with a lot of game types, uh, strongholds. Actually, I think they have a strongholds variant on it. I can't remember. I think if I all the maps have the like the variant because they support the game type. It's just whether or not it actually plays. No, I meant actually in in rotation. Oh, I don't think I can't there is remember one. If I've played strong on that map or not, doesn't sound like there would be one on there. I mean, I know you can go into custom games and play strongholds on it. Yeah, I don't. I I don't know. I mean, Coliseum works well as a CTF map. I think it's pretty much iconic as the Halo 5 CTF map, and I think it works well for it. Mm -hmm. So that's going to wrap it up for us tonight as far as the campaign and the multiplayer stuff goes. We'll have a new poll next week for you guys to answer. Maybe more Halo news. Not sure what's going to be going on afterwards. We'll probably get another update on whatever the prize pool is going to be for the Halo World Championship. That's going on starting December 6th. Again, registration is open for all six regions, so make sure you head on over to Halo.gg for all the latest info, rules, regulations, registration for your region and info on the new HCS recs that you can get a hold of. They'll have some more information on where you can get that or how to get it 
probably here within the next couple of days. They haven't said specifically how you're going to be able to get it, but my guess is there'll be three different packs that you can get specifically. One that probably has the red armor, the red HTS Athlon armor, one that has the white HTS Athlon armor, and one that has the blue, and then comes with the weapon skins and emblems. If they do it that way, knowing me, I will buy all three and see how that goes. We are currently looking for people to help us out with our achieving Halo for Halo 5. Godzilla T is heading that up once again. And if you're interested in helping us out, then please send a message over his way on Xbox Live. You can send a message to Godzilla T or you can hit up our war boards. He has a thread going up there asking for signups if you're part of our Spartan company or feel free to hit him up on Twitter. I think he's doing a couple of things this weekend to try to get a couple episodes recorded. I'm trying to get people organized, yes. And uh, if you do want to be a part of it, be sure to include what days and times you're available, along with your time zone. Yeah, time zones can make it tricky. Yeah, especially when you're West Coast. Yeah. So we're doing that. Give me all that information, and then we will get you worked in, I'm sure. We're also going to be doing another different machinima thing whenever we get file shares, which hopefully comes with Forge. If they don't get file share with Forge, that's going to be very upsetting. If they don't do file shares, there's no point. There's almost no point to Forge. Yeah, it'll be MCC all over again. But even for save films, that needs to be that needs to be file share too. That really does. I hope that's something that they that they get to work. Anywho, we're having a new machinima series that we're going to be doing once we do get the file share. Assuming that we get the file share for film clips, it's going to be 343 ways to die in Halo 5. That's that's basically the premise. So there's like the 1,001 ways to die, like the TV show, and there's been other little video series for different video games on X amount of ways to die, and figured doing 343 being 343 and all, and since there's no safe films in campaign, we really kind of exclude exclude that side of things. So we'll do... 343 with probably like a final episode to make it like 350, 350 ways to die in Halo 5. So it'll be kind of cool. It'll be something that we're hoping to run weekly and we'll get people to send in clips and whatnot. There's already some pretty funny deaths out there that I've seen from Reddit, Twitter, all that stuff that it'd be cool to reenact or maybe get the films for those from the users that made them whenever we get file share for that. So that'd be kind of cool. That's stuff stuff that we have in mind. We have a few other things that we have in mind in terms of what we want to do for the website, what we want to do for the Twitch channel, and all that other stuff coming down the road. So hopefully sometime around Christmas or shortly thereafter, we'll have some uh, kind of a facelift for the website. That's one of the things that we're looking to update as well. And overall, just kind of update the Potacular experience, kind of modernize with Halo 5 a bit. I know we're a little bit behind the scenes when it comes to kind of visually or the visual aesthetics for websites and all the different sites that we have stuff on. So we want to kind of update that and fix that all in due time. As far as the contests go, again, like we said, there's a couple more left, but for everyone that has participated, thank you so much in participating. Thank you to everyone who also gave us some of the stuff to give away, uh, 343 for giving us that big a swag bag at the the launch of Halo 5. And we also got some stuff from Simon Schuster, which we actually have some other copies of Last Night that will be given away over the next couple of weeks as well. And we also have some stuff from Megablocks that we gave away as well. So thank you to the Megablocks collector group for giving us some of those to give away. Uh, it's been really cool to have a lot of this stuff to give away to you guys. And we hope that you guys all enjoy it. Make sure you check us out on our social networks. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, all that fun stuff. Make sure you're subscribed, followed, liking all the stuff whatsoever. And again, we will be posting the remaining of our Intel guides, Skull guides, Legendary Weapon guides, hopefully over the next week, since my voice is all back to normal. No more coughing and no more Darth dust storm and all that fun jazz. So more videos coming pretty soon. Also, make sure you check out our podcast network we are part of the podcast which is a uh, podka.st we can find some other gaming specific shows such as Crit- crits cast which is a tf2 podcast guardian radio which is a destiny podcast the learning cliff which is an eve online podcast and then there is also a work in progress and how to murder time so head on over there if you're looking for some other 
podcast to listen to, whether it's to pass the time at work or if you're actually interested in the games that they want to talk about, they like to talk about, then head on over there. Let them know that we sent you. And overall, they're great podcasts to listen to. Their quality is top notch. And it's they're they're a really great resource. Even if you're just looking for some time to kill it, they're they're awesome to listen to. That'll be it for us tonight. We will see some of you guys tomorrow for Dragon Fridays. And we also have a small event that we're doing with Operation Supply Drop this weekend. Uh, from 10 a.m. to midnight Eastern Time on Saturday, we're going to be doing a stream with them. Uh, kind of a smaller Halo 5 stream. We're planning a, a bigger one in January to get a lot more people involved that we have Forge and support and everything. But we're going to have a few different people on. It's going it's to be pretty small, though. But right now, we're planning to have um, Pro Ace Joker, who is a speedrunner, uh, speedrun a few missions on Halo 5 and... Uh, show some people some tricks on speedrunning in Halo 5 and then we're going to have some crazy customs with Ready Up Live and then we're going to do a podcast with Operation Supply Drop and learn a little bit more about who they are, what their organization is all about, how they support troops and veterans and all that stuff. So we'll have a special podcast for that one so we actually get two podcasts this week and then we'll also kind of follow up with some more campaign gameplay, Warzone gameplay, arena gameplay, all that stuff. So please head on over to Operation Supply Drop. Check them out. We'll be over there uh, pretty much all day Saturday. So please drop on by. We'd love to see you there and uh, help support the troops. So again, whether you're listening to us live on Twitch, downloading us through iTunes, Zoom, or whatever other podcast listener that you subscribe to, thank you for listening to us. Thank you for being here and supporting us. And we will... See you guys next week. Keep on fragging shadow and light. Mm-hmm.